Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have you here for our Max and Lectureship. And, uh, Happy uh, St. Patrick's Day as well. So my husband is half Irish, so I wore my green in honor of uh, his heritage. So we're glad to have all of you here today. Um, the annual Robert P. Maxson Lectureship uh, was established through Dorothy Maxson's generous endowment gift to the School of Business in honor of her husband, Robert Maxson, who was a graduate of the business school in 1948. He was also a decorated World War II veteran and an executive with Mobile Corporation for many years. And so we appreciate deeply their commitment to the school, uh, to the education of our students, and to this lectureship uh, through the years. Uh, the annual lectureship features prominent executives and academics who make presentations on contemporary global management issues. It's designed to add depth to the understanding of the next generation of global business leaders. So many of you who are in the room with us tonight. At the School of Business, we maintain a focus on ethical leadership, globalization, and social responsibility with the goal of engendering positive change within the business community. Uh, these themes serve as co cornerstones of our curriculum, which really is designed to prepare the next generation of thoughtful, responsible business leaders. Uh, the opportunity to present lectures like this one this evening uh, advance our initiatives to offer our students really the, the highest quality business education. So we appreciate you all being here. I know it's going to be an exceptional conversation this evening with our speaker. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the provost, our chief academic officer of the university, uh, Provost Steve Lerman, who's going to introduce our special guest this evening. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Linda, and welcome to all of you to this uh, wonderful lecture. I'd first like to take a moment. Uh, we have a member of a board of trustees here uh, with us today. Heather Foley is here, and I just want to acknowledge her presence, the support of trustees for events here, of course, is always welcome, and their engagement with us as a community, obviously, is, is a wonderful thing to uh, have happen. So I'm delighted to join you for what is the 16th annual lecture uh, honoring, and we're honored here to have as our guest speaker, uh, Jim Clifton. And I'll speak more about his back background and biography in a second. But I thought I'd say a few words about these sorts of lectures. And one of the great things about George Washington University is because of our presence here in the nation's capital, uh, we sit at the center of, of where a lot of things happen. And the ability uh, to be able to bring speakers to this campus uh, who are thought leaders in their industry uh, or in government uh, or in nonprofits and bring them to the campus uh, is obviously of great value educationally. I know many of you are students. There are many places where you would come to study where you would not get that experience on the routine basis it happens here. Now, the other great thing, of course, is that this lecture was endowed by a, a gift. Someone gave money in this case, uh, to fund the costs associated with gathering us together. These sorts of things, the combination of the philanthropy and the access we have here in Washington to thought leaders really is part of what makes the whole experience of being GW very, very special. And so with the thanks to the uh, donors and thanks, of course, to uh, Mr. Clifton and, of course, thanks to all of you for showing up, it's my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker. Uh, so Jim Clifton is the chairman and the CEO of Gallup, uh, a brand name, of course, known around the world. He's held that position since 1988. Uh, under his leadership, Gallup, which is a global leader in consulting and public opinion research and analytics, has expanded for what was previously essentially a US-dominated uh, market and dominated company to what is now a worldwide organization with dozens of offices in over 20 countries around the world. He's the creator of the Gallup Path, uh, which is a metric-based econ economic model that helps organizations find links between human nature in the workplace and business outcomes. This Gallup Path uh, has been adopted by more than 500 of the world's leading companies. His most recent innovation, the Gallup World Poll, is designed to give the world's seven billion citizens a voice in issues ranging from basic individual needs of water and air quality to global perspectives on leadership, world trade, and other issues. He's a prolific writer. He's the editor of The Coming Jobs War and co-author of a book called The Entrepreneurial Strengths Finder. 
He's written extensively on the subject of global leadership, and his chairman's blog regularly appears in the influence section on LinkedIn. Mr. Clifton has long advocated the benefits of education, which of course means it's entirely appropriate for him to be here. He served as the chairman of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. For those of you who don't know this organization, or many of you I'm sure do, it's an organization devoted to supporting college students, and they've supported over 300,000 college students financially in schools around the entire country. This commitment has earned him numerous awards, including honorary degrees from Bellevue University, Medgar Evers College, and Jackson State University, acknowledging his extraordinary contributions to the education of young people. His lecture this evening is entitled, How Entrepreneurs and Business Builders Change the World, an entirely appropriate topic given particularly for your students here, who we all, of course, and you all aspire to actually become business leaders who change the world. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Clifton to the podium. Well, thank you, Steve. I, I have a bit of a mess on my hands here because I prepared one lecture and I, was all, I, I worked on that. And then I sat back in the green room with um, the leadership here. And I said, what, are the, what does the audience want to talk about? And it was something that was very different than what I'd written. So now I've changed all of that. So I'm doing something different. But, if you ever look and say, oh my gosh, he does, he's lost his way, he doesn't know what he's talking about, that's actually what's happening to me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want to make sure that I hit on a few points from the sage advice I got about what, what I notice about young people getting jobs, starting businesses, and all that, so I'm going to make sure I cover that. I'm troubled. I was, used to be a regular guy from Nebraska. I still am a regular guy from Nebraska. But I moved to Washington. I've been here for 15 years. And I think I got too close to where the sausage is made. Uh, so as I watch all the things going on here and with our economy and the world, it made me crazy. And so I, my friends have said to me that I either need to get into therapy or get medicated or something. So I'd, let me get that off my chest. I was watching. Uh, TV about 35 years ago, and there's a panel of economists on. Maybe one of them was from the business school here. <clears throat> and they were talking about the future of America and, its, and her role in the, in the world. And both left-leaning and right-leaning economists just casually talked about how Germany and Japan's GDP would pass us, not unlike you hear about Japan. And they said that they would pass us because of superior management techniques, superior production, superior quality, and all that. And they all just agreed on it. And you all know what GDP is. It's to oversimplify, it's just everybody's sales. You just add up all the companies, the small ones, the tiny ones, and production, you put them all together. If America was a company, we'd have about $16.5 trillion of sales, and we'd have about $100 million full-time jobs, and that, that's, kind of a, that's, that's kind of a America Inc. But they said that Japan, so it's about now, this is their prediction, so these are, they were all making their, as economists do, their best guesses. They said right now Japan would be at about five billion, and they said that Germany would be at about, I don't know, three and three quarters, 3.8 trillion, and that America would come in right now at about three and a half trillion. Can you imagine that? If this economy was cooking along at three and a half trillion rather than 16 and a half, we not only wouldn't be leaders of the free world, we would be more broke than we are now. And this country is really broke right now. <laughs> but now think about that. Look back and you say, well, how did those economists do? You say, well, they blew it. No, they only blew it with America. They were spot on with Japan, because Japan's right at about $5 trillion. And uh, Germany is at about, what are they at? I don't know, 3 point, they're right at 3.8, 3 and 3 quarters. They had bullseyes on those two. But they, 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 it must be the biggest colossal mistake or error in the history of economics, because they missed 
one of the great moments in human development, and that's what Americans did over those 30 years. It's the biggest bull run in the history of mankind. Are there nerds in this class? Are there nerds here? I think I, a couple of you back there should have your hands up, because uh, there's one. There, look at that bold, there's a bold nerd back there. He's got his hand right up. I have, I have many nerdy days, and I love them. But what I did is I took the, the 30 years to the two and a half trillion end of the curve that arced up to 16 and a half trillion, and I added the stubs of the overperformance each year for the 30 years. <laughs> you know what that totals? Well, I don't know what a big number is living in Washington. I was sitting in our in Gallup's, Gallup, the Gallup buildings at 16 and a half. I was sitting in our boardroom with a group of people, and somebody said uh, 50 billion. And I said, wait a minute, are we talking, right now, are we talking billion or million? And everybody in the room kind of leaned back to me, yeah, that's right, are we talking million or billion? <laughs> that only happens in Washington, where you don't really know if you're talking 50 billion or million. <laughs> so you say, what is a big number? The total of those stubs where Americans outperformed in free enterprise, the rest of the world, total those stubs over where we were supposed to be, not all of the GDP, just what we outperformed, it's 100 trillion. Go do it, go do it yourself uh, with, with your calculator. It's 100 trillion. <laughs> That's a big number. But so it means during my lifetime, I lived during the greatest run of, you can call it a bull market or you can just call it human development, Americans seriously changed the world. I don't know why the word exceptional got politicized, by the way, but it was, it was an exceptional moment in, in human development, and we, and we changed, uh, changed the world. By the way, we had so much money, you could do anything you wanted. You know, universities, the university system in America is unbelievable. Even when the Chinese put that list of the top, uh, the top 100 together, we're still, we're, we're 50 of those. You know the ways you can do it with universities? Because we got $100 trillion. If we wouldn't have that 100 we wouldn't have these universities. You know, I love space. I love the military. Military, you know, our budget now is down to half a trillion a year. That's more than the next 20 countries put together. Healthcare, we spend right now about $3 trillion, just on 300 million people. We spend about 10000 a person which is more than double what other good countries spend. Germany, France, Canada, England. We spend more than twice per person. This one, this one will be discomforting. They live longer than we do. <laughs> so when you say, well, this great American health care system and all that, are you sure? Because it looks to me like the more they spend on us, the faster they kill us. But you know why we can spend so much? Hell, it's reckless. We don't even have to take care of ourselves. We just go in and go, doctor, I smoke, I'm obese, everything, I'm, I don't work out. Heal me. You know why we can do that as big old fat smoking Americans? Because we got $100 trillion. Instead of putting a man on the moon, Eisenhower and Van Allen, you know what? You know why we could do that when the Russians put it? Because we were just in the beginning of that $100, that $100 trillion. The, the, I'm all for this. I asked a general, I said, what do we get for, you know, five, six hundred billion a year with defense? Did you know this? So we can have battle on three fronts, and we can have total annihilation in the first 24 hours of war. That's what he told me. So that means that we could, that means we could have war with um, uh, China, Russia. Who would the other one be? Canada? No. <laughs> North Korea, yeah, North Korea. <laughs> but that's what you get for that, for that money. But think about that. You add China, Japan, and everybody else together, and it still does. But you know why we can have a military like this? It's not just because, oh, we're brave. I love the military, so I'm not making fun of them. But you know why we can have all that neat stuff over there? Because of $100 trillion. I'm, I think it's great that we put Pioneer 10 out 8.4 billion miles. You've got to Google it because you won't believe it. 8.4 billion miles. The sun's out only 90 million. Yeah. What's the moon? The moon's not out very far, is it? 86,000. 86, okay, 186. 000. That's good. You win, a, you win a ride on that duck bus I see around here. I'll pay. <laughs> uh, but 186, but that's so, I mean, you could almost drive your car to the moon. 
I mean, if they, had, if they had a road there. The sun's out 90, but that means we got Pioneer 10 out 100 times farther than the sun. I don't know what good it does. We're getting a signal back. Good. You know why we can do that? <laughs> because we got that 100 trillion. We just blow money everywhere. Promise money for retirement and Medicare, Medicaid, just anything that you want. And now we don't. And so where are we right now? I, we were just talking in the green room. Don't you love it? We finally have an issue that both sides agree to, the far left and the far right. And you want to know what it is? It's unemployment and GDP growth. Because you know what they both tell us? White House and the president tell us, we've added more jobs in the last five, six years than we have in the first blah, 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 blah. You know when they say we added 250,000 jobs in February? Do you know what they forget to say? We 300,000 fell out. And the number of people in the workforce is the smallest it's been as a percent in 40 years. Why didn't you say that to me? Did you forget? Is it that hard to remember? So then I turn over to Squawk Box. They should tell me the truth because they're the right. And you know what they say? They say that unemployment's the best it's ever been. And they say we've turned the corner with GDP. Well, what's the economists doing? Why do they do that? Do they hate Europe? It's a European magazine, of course. But they're cheerleaders for our economy, and they say, America's back. I'm just going to tell you a couple points. So what's unemployment? 5.5 or 5.6? Is it? Remember what, the, remember what the denominator is. The denominator is people that are, that are um, in the workforce, which means that you applied for a job that week. But now if I come over, if I mow Isabel's yard, and it takes me one hour more. This is the bar at the Department of Labor. More power to them, they try to do their jobs right. And I get 20 bucks. I'm not unemployed. And let's say I'm an engineer, I have a degree from George Washington. I'm not unemployed. If I come out of the workforce and I'm, uh, just because I've given up, I just don't look, I just can't get hired at all. I'm not counted as out of the workforce. This one, you better Google it because you won't believe it. Do you know how many people have claimed disability and we've given it to them? 13 million. We have more people on disability than we do right now unemployed, according to the definitions. The only one that really makes sense is this one. Do you have a full-time job? You've got to clean all the other crap, crap out. And that's 35 plus hours a week with a paycheck for an organization. That number right now, is departed by, as reported by the Department of Labor, is 48%. For this to work, we have to be at a minimum of 52. It doesn't sound like much. 4%. That's of the adult population. Are, are, you, the, the, are you the only one interested in all these numbers? <laughs> but, but, but that's 10 million. That's 10 million people. But, have you been watching House of Cards? Did you see that? He, the, what's his name's running for president because we need 10 million new jobs? He's right. <laughs> so people say, what, what happened to the middle class? That's where they, he found them. The House of Cards guy found them. They're right there. We don't have full-time jobs anymore. And so those are the things that are falling out of the workplace, and we're replacing them with part-time crappy jobs. Gallup measures the same thing. Now, remember, the Department of Labor does this with a survey. It's not, they're not counting... Um, receipts or jobless applications. It's just a survey. They do 60,000 a month. We mirror it with 30,000. We show 44% of the adult population has a full-time job because we don't count self-employed. Department of Labor counts self-employed. Fine with me. They're at 48. Both those numbers, the 48 is the lowest it's been per capita in 35 years. So in the White House and Wall Street, both say it's the best the workplace has been and blah, 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 blah. It's the worst it's been for full-time jobs. And of, course, and, of course, that's what everybody wants. I didn't mean to make you miserable. I want to get that out. GDP, I'll tell you, is, is, that's because the third quarter was 5. You're business students. You know all this stuff. Second quarter was 4.6. And so they averaged those two. So you get you know, 4.85, whatever it is. Why didn't you tell me what the first quarter was? That was a minus number. You just not add that one in? Because when you put them all together, this year was actually, what is it? Is it 2.4? But if you do a blended five years since the meltdown, we're at about 2.2. 2. 
I can't be any more clear about this. We're going broke. The country's absolutely going broke. There's no other side to it. That's why I need medicated, and that's, that's, why, I need to get it, that's why I need to get into therapy. <coughs> because every place you go, from reading European magazines to the squawk box to the White House, they keep telling us something different. We put a team on it at Gallup to try to figure out where it is. I'm sorry, I'm going to look at my watch because I don't want to go over. We put a team at Gallup to try to figure this out. You got great big companies, and you got middle sized and you got small. The Small Business Association will, uh, uh, Administration will tell you that there's 26 million businesses. There's not, there's six million. 20 million have no employees. Let's just clean those out. I don't, know why, I don't know why they report that 20 million. There's 6 million. Of the 6 million, 4 million of them are mom and pop shops. They average 1.4 people. This town, everybody trying to do their job right, thinks those are entrepreneurs. They are anything but entrepreneurs. They're just people that want a lifestyle. The most important thing to them in the world is freedom. If you go to them and say, hey, let me help you double or whatever, they don't want to double. They just want more freedom. If you can help them get more freedom, they'll do that. They don't want to grow. But of the 6 million active businesses, 4 million of them are those types. One of the reasons they don't work in companies is because they don't fit. When they get up in the morning, the most important thing to them is they do whatever they want. They may open their pizza store. They may not. They may get in the pickup and go paint. My wife can tell you this. They just may not show up. But... That's the freedom that they demand. Now we're only down to two millions. So remember, we were talking about $16.5 trillion that uh, America Inc. has. Of the two million, the number of employees between four and 10 is one million. So now you're only down to a million. Between 10 and 20 is 600,000. Between 20 and 100 is about 500,000. Now we're over two million. What about the rest of them? Between 100 and 500, is, there's only 80,000 businesses in America. See what a precious little rainforest this is? There's only 80,000 between 100 and 500 employees. Between 500 and 10,000, that'd be like Gallup, there's only 18,000. What, think what a small number that is for this great big, we're 20, we're 22 and a half percent of all the money in the world America is. There's only 18,000 between five, and then between 10,000 and up. Remember, 10,000 is not that big of a company. There's only 950. So you got Walmart up here and Target and I don't know, all these great big employees, but it tanks clear, it tanks clear down. That number of corporations in America is getting smaller. I'm from Nebraska. If we had a herd of cattle, the cattle are dying. Here's the problem. New businesses coming in to make the, I'm, I'm getting my metaphors all mixed up here, but the new businesses coming in have been, they've been starting at about 500,000 a year. Let's call those calves. Those are the new calves. That works. Five, it doesn't make America great. We're not leading the world economically and everything else. <coughs> And then there's 400,000 that go broke or are gone or somehow they disappear. So it's a net of 100,000. If you said exactly what's happening, why did America quit growing? It's because those two numbers have just crossed like an X. So now 500,000 businesses are dying and 400,000 uh, businesses are, are, uh, are starting. But that's not a difference of 100,000. That's a difference of a full 200,000. And therein lies the, the energy that we, that, we don't, that we don't have. That's the problem. Is it fixable? Yes. I think we can fix it better than, I think America's had bigger challenges in the last 100 years. I think World War II, that looked like a, <laughs> looked like a pretty big one. This one would be easier to fix. And I think the problem is, is that with, we bet everything on innovation. We said, what's the problem? It's just innovation. We need GDP and we need jobs. All caring leaders got together. I did too. And we said, this is all. What caused that great big bull run where we had $100 trillion of outperformance? Just innovation. So then we spent hundreds of billions and tens of billions and uh, raised our taxes and innovation. What if we're just wrong? What if innovation is just wrong? 
We see we're wrong about how the country's doing right now. What about if we're just wrong with that? So our thinking's wrong. Our premises are wrong. And there's a problem with that as a leader. When your premises are wrong, the more you lead, the worse you make your whatever you're leading. What if it's entrepreneurship, not innovation? What about if we have an oversupply of innovation? You never read about that. I think we do. I think there's innovation all over the place. The lady asked me, um, she, she called me and she said, Jim, can you come up to the Academy of Science and you give a quick talk? I said, well, today? Yeah. I said, uh, it was 9.30. And she said, I need you here at 11.30. I want you to talk from 11.30. And I said, who's in? And she said, it's the presidents of the, of the um, research labs in America. And when you have the presidents of America's research labs, uh, NIH and NASA and um, uh, whatever the other ones are, MIT and all that, you, you have really good people. These are outstanding Americans. They're brilliant. They're master managers. There aren't very many of them either. It'd just be kind of like maybe, maybe, only, maybe only 30 of them. I knew a few, I knew a few of them too. And, and she, she told me, I want you to tell them you think there's an oversupply because they were going up for another $10 billion. She goes, just tell them your side of it. I said, listen, you guys, before you start throwing stuff at me, how many of you in your labs have inventions that just need business models. Every hand went up. So that little poll I did, that wasn't a Gallup poll. That was a census, because that's every single department in America that's made the greatest stuff in the history, history of mankind. One guy, I think it was from NASA. I don't, I, I'll never be able to figure it out. But he said, Jim, I've got something bigger than the internet that I just can't get commercialized. So you say, well, which is it, the chicken and the egg? Is it the cart and the horse? And, and I, I always say I won't do chicken and the egg. I'll do cart and the horse. But I think the cart is innovation, and I think the horse is entrepreneurship. We are experts at developing intellectual gifts. Everybody here tests well, or you couldn't be in this fine, couldn't be in this fine school. But if you have a high IQ, we find every one of you in the United States of America. You can be a poor person in South Central Los Angeles, minority, it doesn't matter what you are. At some point, those teachers will figure it out. And teachers love, the kids don't care, because unless you're a point guard or a cheerleader or something, they, they don't care. But the teachers see that that one's right there has got, got a great mind. And then pretty soon you got a scholarship, you're in a special school, you're on a GW or then Stanford graduate or MIT or whatever, and, and we don't miss any. Unless you have no drive at all, no brilliant person is left behind. We are masters of intellectual development here. And you know what comes out of intellectual development? Piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of innovation. What we don't have is we don't have the intentionality in developing entrepreneurship. So we've got a great big pile of, innova of innovation, and we've got a little bitty pile of entrepreneurship. Do you know why? Because we leave this to randomness to be developed. Right now, if you go to the State Department or the Department of Education and say, give me a list of the 1,000 smartest kids in 11th grade, they'll get it for you. They've got to call around to the states. Go to any state and say, I want to know the 100 highest IQs here in Colorado. They'll get you a list of them. But you know what? This country doesn't need that list because that system works. But if you go and say, give me the thousand kids with the most unusual ability to build a business, which is the only thing we need, they don't have that list. If you go out to Colorado and say, are there any people here that have a real, just they are freaks of nature that could just build something of any size? They go, we don't have any idea. We know, we know brilliance. We, we've got a line on every running back. We know where all the running backs are. Point guards, we don't, we've never, we, no point guards are left behind in this country. <laughs> Quarterbacks. And you see, they, they get hockey. You know, I saw that, that, you know, they found a hockey kid in uh, grade school. They test his eyes. I guess you got to have good eyes. The hockey puck's coming by, what, a two, three hundred miles an hour? I suppose it helps if you have really good eyes. And he also could skate like crazy. Put him in a special school. He, he started in the NHL at like 15 or 16. Think about that development. 
So we can find all of those, but the ones that we need the most, we can't, we can't find. Or if you take a thousand kids in high school and you say to educational psychologists, line them up, smartest to dumbest, thousand to one, they'll, they'll line them up and get real high agreement. But then you say, line them up, tell me about their, <laughs> their unusual ability to start a business and build a big company, then we, we, shrug, our, we shrug our shoulders. But as soon as we can make that as intentional, and we can, we can do it with testing, we can do it with just increasing the awareness of, of, of where we find them. And, and, and early identification and extreme development. Did you notice they've already spotted LeBron James' boy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's just determination? The chances that kid isn't built, doesn't have a different set of DNA and different set of competitive neurons is zero. <clears throat> but again, we don't, we don't know that, that quite yet. And it, until we get that settled, I think it's going to be real hard for our country to make a big comeback because right now we have a philosophy that anybody can become an entrepreneur. If you think that's true, you believe that anybody can be in the NBA. You believe that anybody can quarterback the Denver Broncos. And God created us equally, but he gave us very different gifts, and we all have gifts that we can develop infinitely. Well, we've got to make sure that we know what those are. And right now, all of us have got to figure out who those people are. I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to just kind of suddenly wrap this up so we have time for questions. But there's a role that all of us can play in bringing America back, and it's what role can we play in new startups? If we take the number of 400,000 and just knock it up to 600,000 new startups, remember, it's crashing right now. And with that crash, I think the, this isn't political, this is, just, this is just me. I think the world works better when America is very dominant. You need some kind of leadership. And when we've dominated the, the, the world economically, I'm not talking about militarily, I'm just talking about economically, we build better friendships. We build partnerships around the world. We help China. We got a lot more to do in the Middle East, but at the very end of the day, where we can go help people grow, they get jobs. And I'll sound like, now, I sound like I've leaned right then, now I'll sound like I lean way left. I don't think there would be an ISIS or a Ferguson if the, if the economies were strong in those areas. So when young men, I say men, because men are more dangerous when they don't have jobs than women, if they would get up and have a real challenge, rather than absolutely nothing and humiliation, to deal with because they don't have a job, I think that, that, would, that would change the world. All of us have a role to play in this. We can either be entrepreneurs ourselves, or it's not unlike putting a band together. You do need a lead singer, sort of an alpha entrepreneur type. Somebody's got to write those songs. Somebody's got to play drums. Somebody's got to be the, uh, the person that plays the accordion. But there's a cell in there, or a petri dish, where a lot of different people play. I started something 40 years ago. And one of the guys that was most important, Gail Muller, in, in this, uh, he doesn't have an entrepreneurial bone in his body. He didn't even think sales works. But boy, can he hold people together and, and, and run teams. I've been mentoring some kids um, that have, we, we, we're building tests right now. It's not too hard to test. You can sort people out pretty, pretty fast that have unusual determinations, sense for business model, sense for customers, and that kind of thing. But I think you can become one. You can play on the team. You guys, you also can start venture capital firms. You can join a venture capital firm. You can go find the right people uh, to get behind. You can join Lemonade Days, which is something I, I'm a part of here. About. God, when you watch those, uh, when you watch those kids, it is so easy to pick out the stars. You don't need tests or anything else. It's like watching uh, a bunch of kids play soccer. You know, you look out and you go, "Boy, that one will be playing uh, in the in the World Cup." You can do the you can do the same thing with this. But as Americans, we've got to start developing a whole different new road for entrepreneurship. We've got to be writing down what we learn. We've got to do a lot of research about it at great universities like this and put the course on a, or put the country on a very entrepreneurial course. I got kind of wound up. I'm just going to stop my remarks right here and say thank you very much. Do you have some questions for me? Yes.
are your entrepreneurial strengths by your book? What are key characteristics that students or even higher educators can use in the classroom to produce more of those entrepreneurs? Well, she's asking what are a few of the themes that we've found. <clears throat> First of all is unusual determination, but very rare. Now, if you have all of these parts, it's about five in a thousand. If you do the quick math, there's 15 million kids in high school right now. And it means that there's 75,000. If you said how many Steve Jobs are there, or Larry Ellison's or somebody, there's 75,000 kids roaming the streets and hills right now in America, and we don't know who they are. Yeah, we found one in 10,000 are social entrepreneurs. One in 10,000. Yeah. Well, let's see if it's, ours finds them not quite that, not quite that rare, but, but anyway. But determination. One of the big things about determination is that if you get knocked down, some people say, I gotta have a way to deal with it, and I do, I come back, but I gotta do this, and I gotta do that. The, if you have extreme determination, when I knock you down, you have a governor that actually makes you more determined. Um, so so that, that's one. Another one is that they have a, nat a natural inclination to profitability in, in business, making a profit. You know, there's a joke that the bad business person says, I buy steaks at $7 and sell them at, it's not funny, but it's a joke. I buy, I buy steaks at $7 and I sell them at five. And the other person says, well, how are you gonna make a profit that way? And you go, volume. <laughs> well, that's, that's the bad, but the, so they have a natural inclination. Um, um, oh, I found one that's really like cheating. I was just telling them I was doing a thing down in Atlanta. They had a test of a whole bunch of um, kids that it started companies, <laughs> or that, that they were given their pitches for their companies, like a Shark Tank thing down there. And, and uh, one guy had something very different. So it was the four finalists. One guy had something that was very different than the other three. What do you think his was? He, he already had a whole business set up and running. You don't, he didn't need to answer the questions or anything. It's, it's working now. But you can ask very young people, do you, so you can ask them tricky questions, you know, find out about their neuron configurations, their wiring and all that. But how about this one? Do you run a business right now? People that have high entrepreneurial, they, they already know that they have that. After that, it gets a little more complicated. You have some people that, we were talking about Richard Branson, and yeah, you know, Richard Branson's afraid of audiences, very odd. Um, very afraid. Now, if he's with a small group, he's one of the most persuasive people in the in in the world, and he's very good with relationships, very warm. And all. but after that, you'll have pieces in there that you've got to realize are your strengths, and then put those together. So it's really how you play kind of your own piano keys. Um, but but those are a, those are a few important ones. You can't make it without the extreme. Deter you have no chance without the extreme determination. No, but that's such an, but I think that's the zillion dollar question. And, and people don't like me when I say that because most all universities have already set up their entrepreneurship classes. And I kind of developed this theory so you can, don't dislike Gallup for me saying it, just dislike Jim Clifton. But they'll ask me to go to their entrepreneur classes and I sit down with these poor guys. I, I, they were, this one I'm talking about was all the young men. And I don't know if they'd all given up that they couldn't become something else, but somebody talked to me to saying, well, you ought to try being an entrepreneur. You, you wouldn't bet $5 on any, on any one of these. They're nags, you know. But, so, but some caring professor, some caring American is just on the wrong. But here's what's important about your question. You can develop it. So the question is, get the right kid. And now you're teaching well, just, it's funny how teaching works on people with a whole bunch of talent. But, but, but the point is, use all that magic stuff that you do on somebody that's loaded with talent. Then, then they grow infinitely. What's your question? How does this unusual determination usually manifest itself in younger children? So, I mean, I know, you know their, their propensity for understanding business models, but they're just determined everything, solving a Rubik's Cube, coloring inside the lines. Like what? 
What is it that normally manifests itself to show that they have that unusual? I, I don't know the answer to your question. I think it would only I think you and I could only do that observationally. We we can only pick it up with our testing at about eighth grade. Underneath that, it, it starts to be a, um, a uh, reading test. But I think you can observe. Boy, it's so easy to observe with uh, how, you know, the wound up. You know, kids will get some, this, this lemonade days thing that some of you are involved in. But, you know, kids will get some rejection, and yet they'll keep trying. They'll try to, they'll try to, somewhere. I think you can, observationally, we can't really test them very well until the eighth grade. Something I feel so good about, just as, or optimistic about is that we don't show the, the, the variation in race. God was very egalitarian when he handed this one out. And nobody will write this down. He wasn't as egalitarian handing out IQ. <clears throat> but he was with this. And this is the one we need most of all. But so far, we show blacks, Hispanics, um, Anglos to have no significant difference. That's not the big one, though. The big one is no significant difference between men and women. All the low-hanging fruit. If you want to bring America back fast, the one you'd work on is women. Because women should be able to create businesses, and they're not creating enough. We're way behind with women. Um, but, but there's, uh, I think that's where the lowest, I think that's where the lowest hanging fruit is. I was going to say, so. oh, the, um, the, the one that does predict, though, is if you're an immigrant. So immigrants, are like four times more likely to have the determination. Like, makes sense, doesn't it? And then if you're one degree off the immigrant, you have like two to three times more. So one of the reasons we might need a whole bunch of immigration is because we, you can, I can say this, I don't know, who, can somebody fire me? But <laughs> we need immigrants to breed us up. Because wh whatever they do and they're coming in, you, you start following it. And the closer you are to immigrants, more likely you are to start, business, start businesses. I did another nerdy day. You, you take that whole thing. You could argue San Francisco, the determination, innovation, and everything else that happened out there with venture capital people and the university getting all wound up, saved Americans, saved America in that $16.5 trillion. I mean, it's incredible what they, what they did out there. Another guy and I figured out only 1,000 Americans did that. Think how small that is. How the hell did that happen? But of the 1,000, 600 of them weren't born in America. They're Americans, but they weren't born in America. Most of them are Indians. But, when, but th there's, your, there's the unusual energy, because that's way outside the, the, the norm. What's your question? So, so Jim, personality issues and individual differences are important, but culture is important, too. Don't we have a culture that's hostile, openly hostile to business and entrepreneurship and wealth creation? Yeah. There's no question we do. The, the spirit of free enterprise is really off. And, and if you said, what is it that causes that? You know, there's a few of them you can go back to. Look at the gold rush. People are just crazy. Think of that energy. But that's a, that's a spirit of free enterprise like you haven't seen for a long time until the dot-com uh, move came along. Think of all of that energy. You know, people go broke. It's kind of ugly to watch, but up out of it pops, you know, Yahoo and Amazon and Google and all, all, all kinds of things. But there is no question that, that there is a, uh, a, a damper on the, on the spirit of uh, free, free enterprise right now. I was aware the importance of the two. Of which, of... Uh, Individual differences, this determination that you're finding in certain people. Well... <clears throat> I think, I think you get up in the morning and you think, this is the morning that I'm going to make my move to America. This is the morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to start a business, even though my wife told me not to, the minister told me not to, everybody told me I'm crazy and all that. You've got to do it. <clears throat> but there's not much resistance in there that can just have you say, well, I'm going to start tomorrow. And that's where I think that, the, the, that there's a spirit that makes a difference. And I don't think fiscal tools do. Most people in this town think, well, then we need to, you know, uh, make loans easier. It doesn't make any difference. Because when, when you do a variation study of where loans are more likely to, uh, you, you, don't get, you don't get separation. <clears throat> I'm answering a little different question than you asked. But determination, I think, is about the same as it was maybe 20 years ago. But there's a lot of headwinds right now. Small businesses say, 
that they're not growing, they're not sticking their necks out because of two reasons, and it's not money, it's regulations. And we say, really, which ones? And the first one out of their mouth is health care. Second one is environment. So he said, well, we need those. Okay, go ahead. But it's getting pretty tricky because we may be doing it at the expense of, the, of, the, of not, not having uh, enough money to go around. That's where we are now. Uh, how could the current collegiate environment be changed to better support people who are, are I students? can't hear you. How could the, better, uh, the current collegiate... Yeah. How could the current collegiate environment be changed to better support people who, or students who are inclined towards entrepreneurship? How can the what be changed? The, the, the systems that we go through in college, the, oh. the environment of college, the atmosphere, everything. I, I, think that, I think the first universities that create their own Juilliards, it, where it's really hard to get in and you've demonstrated that you have exceptional ability to create a customer, let's make it that simple, to create a customer, I think those people should be in a spec. I mean, just like you have uh, people in music, or like, isn't that, what's that show, Glee? Aren't all those people in there doing the same thing? They're, but, but, but they need to be, but you, but, but you need to, it needs to be a real struggle to get in. I was reading the names of the people in Juilliard. It's incredible. You know, America entertains the whole world. That's another one. Running backs, IQ, point guards, and entertainment and the arts. We're just absolutely great at that. But we don't, have a, we don't have a Juilliard or we don't have a football team where you get cut and only the stars can play. And you think about it, how many people start on a basketball team in a big high school? Five. And nobody's there because they just feel like they deserve it or you know, they paid to get in. You really got to work to get in. But, so I think that's one thing. But I think there can be another entrepreneur class where there are people that will play supportive roles. They might even own it. There's some pretty good entrepreneurs out there that don't own most of it. There's a role that you can play in it, but I think universities have to, um, have to teach that part too. But one should be a very special place for unusually talented young people. What's your question? First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Clifton, for coming to speak with us tonight. So March 9th marked the sixth anniversary of our current bull market. And unemployment is down to about 5.6%. Everything seems good. Everybody, as you had alluded to earlier, everybody seems to be reporting positive news about the economy. Unfortunately, there seems to be, as you had alluded earlier, the, a disconnect between the current state of the economy today in terms of innovation, in terms of people that are working in the workforce to what is being reported to today. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts about the current state of people who have been, well, who, have, who have gone through some really tough times during the last great recession, this great recession that we went through, people that are still working part-time jobs, those who are fairly new out of college, young adults, those who are you know, mid-career professionals who have suffered from the Great Recession, who are now still working part-time jobs, or not doing the jobs that they were, that they had excelled at or were potentially going to excel at. Um, those who are hidden innovators, those who are hidden entrepreneurs, what is this country doing to help them get back to where they should be or where they want to be? Because it seems like in this day and age, we're punishing those people for the fact that they didn't succeed to a certain level. And getting back to where they want to be seems to present more challenges despite all the innovations going on in social media in terms of you know, communication, being able to get themselves out there. Can you talk a little bit about that for those people? Well, you know, the 5.6% of what 140, that what the, the, they report that eight, that 8 million people are out of work. If you add in what you just said, it's 24 million. That's a staggering, and that doesn't even count the 13 million that are claiming disability. 24 million people woke up in, in a situation where either they're clear out or they're grossly, or they're grossly underemployed. I don't know if I'm going to answer your question or not. The only answer, 70% of new good jobs are found in startups of firms. So not me selling... Uh, 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 some kind of hand-carved guitars on the weekend or that I register as a business. 
Um, but, but in a firm has one full-time employee and a proprietor. That's, it turns out that's a really high bar. But those average, <clears throat> the first year, five full-time good jobs. That's where the new good jobs have to be. They are not in the Fortune 500 or the Russell 2000. Those are big companies that have growth because they're buying other firms. They have no organic growth at all, zero. <clears throat> So, I mean, there are, jobs, there are jobs in there, but they're not where the new good ones are. And then in that bunch of new businesses that start, some will, will boom up out of there. Not, not just Facebook, but all kinds of them, a big cement company or, or, or whatever. That's where they are. I think for, <clears throat> for individuals, there's a, there are a couple of things. Students, and we find this over and over again. How many of you have taken StrengthsFinder? All of you. I think that the most important thing in getting a job is, is I'm just going to call it confidence. So w w whether you show up at Gallup, you show up at small business or wherever it is, if you feel good about it and you know you've got something to offer and they're absolutely crazy if they don't hire you, that state of mind <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. That's what you're, that's what you're going for. But if you can put the pieces together, th there's kind of a gestalt where you walk in and they go, that's our, that's our person. But it starts with knowing what your own strengths are. The worst you can be is where you're kind of a fraud that day. You've got to make it up and say you're somebody that you're not and all that. But <clears throat> you take your top five strengths and then you build your strategy. And, and two or three of them you'll know are really you. But then figure out how you can apply those to the assignment, to, to the task at hand. This is kind of specific, but I have a lot of young people that say I'm going to go over friends and family and all of that. <clears throat> when you show up, demonstrate that you know a lot about customers, and it'll make you different. Because every CEO, including me, the biggest problem I have every day, there's only one, very hard to control, and it's customers. And so use your strengths and tell them how you apply uh, uh, to customers. And I think that makes a lot. It, Six Sigma is great. I love it. Lean is great. Reengineering is great. No, we don't need that. We have leaned and reengineered and everything. And there, there's no big, there's no low hanging fruit there. We've got to beat the whole world in customers. But I think when you show up strengths and, and uh, you know, uh, customers, those are two real big ones. Uh, there's, there's another one that if you, you didn't ask me this, but this might be important. If you said, what are some things that you've, I've had the same job for over 40 years. What are some things that you learned that you never learned in business school? Um, <clears throat> this sounds so simple, but uh, how you present yourself, that first impression is just everything, and it will be your whole life. And if you don't make a good first impression, just don't ever come back. I don't care if you're trying out for a job. Or if, I make sales calls all the time. I, I blew one uh, last week in Kansas City. It doesn't, I'll just never go back there again. I just wasn't, I just wasn't perfect. I look great, too. <laughs> but but uh, my content stunk and all of that. Because the first impression is, is just a, is the whole thing. But I, th but I think that's real important, too. Closing words of wisdom for our audience tonight? Well, I, everybody raised their hand on <clears throat> strengths, and I got my, uh, some colleagues here, but I think that one of the biggest discoveries that we've made with people, regardless of what situation you're in, what your major is, or whatever it is, if m most learning will tell you to try to fix your weaknesses, our whole country is set up to do that, um, and you never get any better. You've got to do something with your weaknesses, but you need to make them irrelevant. But when you can move your career to your strengths and stay on them, you get compounded learning. If you can stick with the same thing, then your development's seriously infinite. And, and that's, a, that's a hell of a way to lead a life. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's give a hand to the <laughs> We just had a
have a, a small token of appreciation for you joining us for the Maxson Lecture. And thank you so much for your wisdom and insight. And we appreciate you being with us this evening and sharing your time with us. So it's great being here. Thank, thank you. you so okay. much. Thank you. And thank all of you for coming this evening and being part of this. I hope you found it uh, interesting and provocative and inspiring in a variety of different ways. And so we wish you uh, a good evening and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.